It's uh, time for Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast from the Spacebook for the Fandom Podcast Network. With me, Dan Hadley, Birmingham's King of the Geeks, your designated driver and mouth runner, ready to deliver Doctor Who content and conversation once again on our free speaking, big thinking, eclectic show for everyone whatever decade or century you started watching, reading or listening along to those ongoing adventures of our hero, Doctor Who. We talk about it all on this show. There may even be, be a few laughs along the way. So come and step into our TARDIS and share this journey together here with us on Type 40. <laughs> We're back again here in Type 40 land for more Doctor Who talk back through the decades, back through time the way only we can. And we've got some serious art appreciation going on. God, that sounds almost highbrow. It sounds a bit late show, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, joining me for another wonder through the TARDIS gallery, of course it is. It's my mate, Simon Norton, back on the show. Hello, mate. Well, hello there. Yeah, it, it, it does almost sound late show, doesn't it? We kind of need Joan Bakewell just off off uh, off camera uh, to do some introductions. You, you and I. Can both... you imagine? Can you imagine what she'd make a make of a make of shenanigans? Thing. You and I have both worked uh, on and off. Uh, well, on and off for me, more on for you in the graphic art and design. Mm -hmm. Um, we've both done it and so we're both massive fans of the whole sort of you know the graphic design world um and artwork um and and also because i worked in in did, did uh, many years working as, as a fanzine editor um again looking yeah. for artists uh again you're always looking for that interesting artwork um and interestingly the guy that we're about to bring on had had at least a small influence on me becoming a fanzine editor, as I'll explain a little bit later on. So uh, really? art is, yeah, art's very close to my heart. Doctor Who art in particular is very close to my heart. It does. It finds it finds a way, doesn't it? That it this show finds a way of chiming with whatever sort mm -hmm. of artistic inclinations each of us have. I think whichever media we want to explore that in. And I think that our guest on this show is a typical example of that, but somebody who absolutely has gone gone beyond the fourth and the fifth dimensions. And his, his work is absolutely everywhere. If you are somebody who's collected Doctor Who merchandise over the years, either you were there at the time or you've picked it up since, the odds are you'll, you'll certainly have lots of this guy's work in your collection. So yeah, I hope that I hope that he's, uh, he's primed, stretched, fed, and watered as we bring on yeah the uh, he calls himself forget this the last of the traditional cover artists simon that's very that's very romantic and quite I, heroic quite I heroic isn't it i think it's probably reasonably close to the truth as well i don't think anybody could actually argue with him on that one to be honest only one way to find out let's bring on colin howard <laughs> greetings Hello, colin. Guys, how are you? hi colin <laughs> I'm, how I'm, I'm good. Our things. Yeah, so who um, came who came up with that then? The last of the traditional cover artists. That that was weirdly me. Um, I was trying to sort of uh, explain what had been going on basically with art at the time because it was a big quantum leap away from all the traditional old stuff that I grew up with as a kid, and um, I guess most of you guys did as well, uh, where you were solely at the um, the reliance of what one particular person would create off a blank piece of um, card or canvas or artboard, whatever they were using. Um, and it suddenly all just dissipated away and became photo montage fun. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so yeah, I was, I guess I was the last of the actual painters. Um, there do, you, you go. do you more, do you mourn the passing of those days of, of, of real art? physical art maybe is a fairer word yeah i i kind of guess that i do simply because there's nothing sort of as lovely for me as um holding a piece of artwork that graced the cover of something and i mean collectors especially because that's an original one-off um doesn't exist anywhere else you know it's not on a, um, a microchip or a drive saved somewhere, you know, it, it's a physical piece of medium that you can uh, hold up and admire and sit on your wall and look at for years and uh, just appreciate the beauty of the effort that so we went in 
to creating this one solid real item. Um, something yeah. something yeah. tactile, Colin, and something yeah. intimate. Yeah, not just a collection of uh, pixels smudged around and moved, you know. Um, I mean, I do a bit of that as well, but uh, that, that's in this day and age. But it's, it's, yeah. it's interesting because um, when we uh, interviewed the, the sadly late and very, very great Chris Akeleos a couple of years ago, one of the things that he said, he obviously also talked about mourning uh, the passing of, of uh, physical art as opposed to digital art. And as he said, in, in the physical world, there is no undo button. Whereas oh. with digital yeah, art, you can yeah. undo anything you like and tweak it until you, your heart's content. But you can't do that. And certainly for me personally, I'm not an enormous fan of digital art. It, it's the physical medium where you can see, as you say, the, literally the physical contact with that medium yeah. and the love and care and attention that's gone into creating something that actually exists in the real world rather yeah. than just as a pixel on a computer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm as guilty as anyone else, I guess, of, of doing that kind of stuff um, with the work on the animations and um, even putting together the cover for, for this beast here, this subtle... <laughs> Is that your new book by any chance, Colin? This could perhaps be the executive uh, <laughs> work of Colin Howard, whoever that guy is. Um, and yeah, I mean, for that cover, um, it was originally, there you go, get the wrong hand and the wrong direction. That book cover. Ah, the, the end doctor. Doctor from Virgin Books that I did in the 90s. And um, I was racking my brains to try and think of what to put on the cover um, and to make it look like, you know, something that I might have produced back then. So I thought, I know, I'll just tinker about with this one because the gift of it was the fact that it was um, a, a piece of like old um, cine film, whatever, yeah. floating there out in the ether. And I thought, well, I'll just take each frame and put one of my monsters from one of my paintings into it and uh, had to morph it and bend it around, alter perspective, distort yeah. things slightly to get it to sort of look fluid and part of that reel of celluloid floating out there um so yeah that was a, a, a bit of tinkering around in photoshop with that to, to, to create, create possibly the most colin howard piece of artwork of them all i think it, but it's, it's all, you know colin squared time <laughs> million. All right. it's, it, it's really interesting because I mean, you are just such a prolific doctor who artist and for example i mean i've got the nth doctor in my book collection and i had no idea until you just mentioned it, that it was you that did the cover. And this is the truth. I think you are, you above all Doctor Who artists are the one, whereas Dan said right at the top of the show, everybody who's collected Doctor Who at some point in their life will have something by Colin Howard in their collection, but probably without even realising it, because you've oh, done, you've done so much stuff. You are undoubtedly, I would say, the most prolific Doctor Who artist in the, in the world. Wouldn't you say so? Yeah, I'm just not fussy, am I? <laughs> you take any old gig. Yeah, do anything for anything, for anyone. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's, um, I think I mentioned it in the book as well, because there's a load of burble from this bit. And um, I just basically loved the show so much that right from a small child, probably like Jeff as well, um, was always drawing and creating Doctor Who related things be it um, the Weetabix stand-up cards of like the 70s. Um, I mean, I've still got those in the tobacco tin. And yeah. uh, sort of um, uh, the antimatter Zeta Minor, yeah. uh, Planet of Evil tin. They're quite tiny, aren't they, these these little cards? Literally the, yeah. the size of... So you've got the, Fer you've got, was it Farrar's toffee little, little... Oh, I wish I wish it was that. Now this this one is like a sort of a, a Holborn rough shag or something. Close yeah. enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny you should say that about the things that, about the things that you've put out because as we're sat now for the for the people who are watching the video track and we can see we can see right behind you there's some of your greatest hits and for example <laughs> I've got that Dalek calendar that you that you did in the nineties again I forgot not. I didn't just forget that you did that. I forgot that I owned it. I've got that upstairs. <laughs> it's in one of my various boxes or, or whatever else. You know, oh, God, yeah, and that, that's sort of, that sat yeah. on my desk for a long, long time. 
couple of years after whatever year it was supposed to go with i think we sometimes do that as fans don't we keep turning the keep the calendars for longer than we should keep using them yeah that that one was um the 2000 desk calendar uh there was a tardis as well the same size um thank you slow dazzle for never returning my original artwork from swine <gasps> Um, slow dazzle that's the name yeah yeah so somewhere out there is um, a, a tardis and a dalek um oh. both of which are kind of like a3 in height uh and that's the um the peter cushing movie yeah uh, the dalek invasion of, of course Earth, of course it is um so in that same livery well um, although although slow dazzle haven't been in touch plenty of people have haven't they with the release of this book time slides it includes would you call it testimonials, tributes from just some of your many admirers in the world, in the Who universe out there? John Freeman, former editor of Doctor Who magazine and current editor of, of uh, St official Star Trek magazine and of Down the Tubes. He talks about your work in this book. So does the writer Rob Shearman. We've got Gary Russell contributing content, the brilliant graphic designer Lee Binding. There's Margaret Hope, who was with children's uh, BBC Children's Books, Nick Abadzis, who is a writer with the Doctor Who comics at, at uh, I think that was your Titan. Martin Garati, we'll all know Martin's work from Doctor Who magazine, sequential comic book art. Our mate, Neil Cole, he's in there as well, Simon. Yeah. And uh, Lee Sullivan too, legendary Doctor Who comic strip artist, Lee Sullivan, plus Pete McTighe, the guy behind all those brilliant uh, shorts that we get on the Doctor Who Blu-ray collection. That's just a fraction of your fans. You've got two more here. Lots more I'm certainly going to be listening and watching along with us as we get into our conversation. That's all cup coming up. <laughs> See, I was, I was saying to you, one of us might trip over our words. It's almost certainly going to be me. That's all coming up in a moment. But if you'd like to do some real time traveling of your own, each and every edition of this show, past, present and future, is just a tap or two away on the device of your choice, only if you know where to look. There's well over a hundred reviews, previews, interviews, geek outs and deep dives with all our regulars and some pretty awesome guests. In fact, we know there's something for every fan at type40.podbean.com. More about that a little later. And we'll be making contact just for a couple of minutes with that matrix of all knowledge that we call the fandom podcast network for a word about all the other cult conversations going on across all the other podcasts over there so much to get into that's all the sort semi-sensible stuff done now colin you could be pleased to know Let's see if we can yeah we'll get on the same page or should that be uh, canvas as we uh, we're going to take in this slideshow aren't we this time slideshow courtesy of colin howard and all his artwork all those years all those memories get stuck in with us here now on type 40 where are we where have we got, what have we got to hit yeah, it's this <laughs> Yeah, as, uh, as much as we often get misty-eyed about pretty much any element of Doctor Who on TV, the music, all that quotable dialogue, the ideas, the themes that it introduces us to and, and plays with within that uh, infamously flexible format that we boast about as Doctor Who fans, it's a TV show. And the visuals are the most important part. They're the bits that stick with us the most, that sort of fill our dreams or our nightmares. And uh, yeah, they, they do, they definitely stick with us over time. They, they scare us, scar us, and inspire us. And uh, many of us are moved to recapture those moments, aren't they? Just as, as we were discussing a moment ago, recapture the, uh, the sights of the Doctor Who universe and interpret them or reinterpret them in lots of artistic ways. And it has been a driving factor behind many of us pursuing the careers that we do and that's certainly been the case with our guest this time colin howard you're absolutely one of the most published doctor who related art artists out there and you've got a style that i believe that none of us could confuse with with anybody else's and <laughs> it's natural though isn't it that with uh, this mountain of work that you've produced over the years that you've earned this family of fans haven't you people love your work well god bless them for that uh, you were saying earlier about the uh, the list of uh, wonderful uh, contributions I had from people. Um, it, this book should have been sponsored by like Kleenex or something because the amount of um, 
kind of sobbing almost, I was reduced to reading these things. Um, because I always just thought of myself as a, like, you know, just a, a jobbing artist, illustrator. A jobbing artist. Artist. Yeah. <laughs> and um, af after the, um, the cover stuff sort of stopped with the advent of computer generated art, I had to just walk away from all sort of Doctor Who related stuff. Uh, because it was just too painful to keep seeing it. And, well, uh, Colin, think... do you remember that some there was a, a famous singer songwriter who once said that life is what happens whilst you're making other plans? And I think that mm. the same can be said of of legacy too. When you're building up a, a body of work, you're going from job to job in something which is a commercial sector, isn't it? Your your mm. artwork, you know, you're you're a fine artist. But your artwork has been put on commercial product, hasn't it? Which, to a great many people out there, apart from Doctor Who fans, commercial product is largely a disposable realm, isn't it? But that's not how the Doctor Who universe views these things. Not at all, is it? No, it uh, becomes sort of cupboard fodder and <laughs> <laughs> stored in various places and, and things. Um, yeah, it, it's wonderful um, because it... it you just kind of don't think that stuff you do is going to last or be remembered. Uh, and certainly not you as an artist yourself. You really have trouble accepting the fact that um, somebody might really admire and love the stuff that you've done and keep it for all this length of time. Um, you, you just don't feel sort of worthy of it all. Um, well, I, I don't anyway. It's just the way I am, I guess. But... Um, no, it, it was just, um, say, incredible, some of the things that people were saying about me. And um, I sort of count myself incredibly blessed, actually, because I'm, as far as I'm aware, the only um, Doctor Who related artist that's actually um, had an introduction for their Doctor Who art book by a doctor. Which one's is, this for the people who don't know? Uh, this will be old 60. Brilliant. Old namesake uh, Colin Baker, who um, <laughs> I first met years and years ago in Norwich when he was in a play, um, Corpse, at the Theatre Royal. Oh, yeah. and, um, I remember, I, I remember, him. I went to see Corpse in, with Colin Baker in Birmingham. I remember it very well. Yeah, and a load of us sort of Norwich local group people, we'd raised some money for Cop Death, which uh, was a, yeah. uh, Colin a massive patron of for many years after his unfortunate loss. And um, we met him there and I sort of, we presented him with the check and then being me, I sort of showed him some of my art and um, he seemed to like it and um, ended up writing me a, a kind of like a testimonial letter sort of um, to prospective publishers to go, look, I've seen this guy's stuff, give him a go. Um, oh, wow. Which, so that, is that how you got your lucky break through Colin? That was one of the main reasons, yeah, I think Wow. So. Um, also, I obviously created a portfolio body of work that I could take around and show uh, prospective uh, graphic designers and managers. And um, yeah, so it was great to sort of pitch for Doctor Who stuff with a letter from a recent doctor. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it, it was quite a, quite a lovely thing of him to do. So, this uh, is why this is why it's so right that Colin Baker is the the president of the Doctor Who Appreciation Society. I've heard several stories of Colin doing things like this, and mm. his relationship with the fandom it, it never ceases to surprise me. But yeah, Time Slides it's finally published. I've been reading about this book now for it seems like about a year and a half. Colin, it's available from Candy Jar Books. It's this huge retrospective celebration of your work with all these tributes to from these uh, admirers of yours. How does it feel to have it finally out there? So it's uh, waiting under Christmas trees and <laughs> <laughs> it's in the post to several people, probably hundreds, thousands of people by now. It must feel great knowing that people are finally going to get to see it. Yeah, it was quite a long time in the, um, the planning. I first agreed to do this book um, around the time that we uh, finished work on the Macro Terror and somebody asked me at the uh, BFI screening and um, I said look I've, I've agreed to do this and there will be a portfolio of my work. Um, how long it took to then come out was um, quite a surprise. I mean the pandemic uh, had a, quite a lot to do with it and uh, uh, the funny thing here is the, um, the image you keep showing is the original cover that I did 
Um, but I had to change everything yet again for the actual book because I realized that most of, well, if not all of these creatures on the cover weren't actually in the book. <laughs> so to, it's kind of like an unintentional misrepresentation of content. Um, yeah. So I had to rejig it totally and change all the creatures in those film cells uh, yet again. Um, so just to make work for myself, you know. And what, and what, why is that? Is that simply because you just couldn't fit the entire body of work in there? Yeah, essentially. I mean, um, I initially, when we were first planning it, this was going to be a massive volume um, featuring pretty much everything I'd done. Um, but unfortunately, with a, a page count limitation, there just wasn't room. So we opted to concentrate on my um, 33 Doctor Who stories that were the VHSs, yeah. uh, which came down to 32 because of Frontios the Awakening being a single release. And um, yeah, it, that was the main body of work and content of the book was uh, my VHS years. So um, yeah. And that, that's, that's of course where I had and that, of course, is where people are most likely to know your work from is from the uh, is from the the, the VHS covers. The yeah. Which so you if you did. can see these guys, these are all uh, from the VHS covers, including. I mean, we've got Terry Malloy's Davros there at the top. Um, that was never actually released as a uh, VHS cover because um, Re Resurrection, no Revelation of the Daleks was pulled uh, because of issues with clearance for i think the uh, the audios that the dj was playing all the way through yeah, yeah. and um i <laughs> i just finished that painting and was about to post it off because um michelle and i were about to go on a delayed honeymoon um because i was so busy working um we booked and got uh hoover flights i don't know if you guys are all can remember <laughs> oh hoover flights i do yeah. remember that yeah wow yeah, we, we bought a vacuum cleaner when we yes. got married for the house and uh, thought, brilliant, we'll, we'll take a, like this free holiday and go and see our friend Bev in New York who um, helped treat uh, my mother when she was uh, uh, having treatment for breast cancer. And uh, we stayed in touch with her since like the, the mid 80s, 90s. And we, we still see Bev regularly. And um, yeah, this was our delayed honeymoon. And um, we were about to go away and um, I had four days before we were going to go down to get the flight. And um, they said, well, Revelation isn't being released now. Um, we need Inferno. <laughs> so I then had to quickly do a sketch for the cover of the Inferno in VHS. Take, the, take it away, get it faxed for crying out loud, if anybody remembers fax. Machine. I remember using faxes and having to send artwork to get to get approved via fax as well. Yep, that's the bunny as well, yep. And that, I ended up getting approval for the, uh, the pencil and had to paint that in three and a half days. Wow. And then get it packaged up and posted off. Um, so it was a bit of a, a massive, massive rush to, to do that particular cover. So, <laughs> And all with the template in mind as well, because this is what people don't always realise out there. You've got to consider where the logos go, haven't you? Barcodes, any uh, any elements of text. For the, for in, in the case of the Doctor Who releases there, it's starring mm. whichever Doctor. Yep. A little triangle or circle with the, uh, with the certificate on. All that's going to be... It's going to be very easily seen, isn't it, from people who could be could be browsing it? Oh God, yeah. I mean, the the whole design aspect of it with these, it was a for me, it was an ongoing nightmare. Um, because, <laughs> uh, design was so different back then. You you'd map everything out and carefully plot the positioning of absolutely everything and plan your cover based around that layout and. Um, the BBC would then send the, uh, the artwork off to be photographed and um, they would then be supplied with the image to use. And it was whoever did all the, um, the cropping and messing about uh, would always change my layout 
and concentrate on one particular area of a picture that I wasn't going to. And I had so much cropped out and lost of my originals. So that's the really wonderful thing about Time Slides is that I'm able to include the full artwork. All of it was designed and plotted out to take everything into account. But um, if it had been this day and age, it's great because you can work to the image size that you're giving. Um, so I can plot everything out myself and supply the full final artwork just straight for print. Um, but it was this <laughs> third party company, I don't know who the hell it was, but they were ridiculous. Um, the Five Doctors was absolutely butchered by them. Um, half a Cyberman from the, like, the waist down is missing um, and chopped out. And it just ruins the composition. I mean, luckily, they still all pretty much work, but uh, they weren't as I'd intended them to look. It's how it's some of these well, things, yeah, they uh, do. They're bugbears for several years, aren't they? Bones yeah. of contention. And it's and it's interesting because you, the, the composition that you tend to work with on on certainly on the VHS covers, it's very very classic composition in style, isn't it? It reminds me very much of of um, sort of the film posters of artists like Drew Struzan. It's that kind of classic composition uh, mm. of a montage put together beautifully assembled with it with a, with, with you know with a with a, a, a you in your mind's eye you know how it's going to look it's they're always beautifully balanced in some form um, and I say it reminds me very much of sort of Drew Struzan's kind of compositional style um if not artistic style um which is one of the reasons why I love your your stuff so much because it does remind me of those great film posters when film posters were great um yeah. Do you yeah, think you were influenced? Did you take sort of influence from sort of film posters, artwork? I mean, I was a very um, deeply fantasy sci-fi uh, kind of image-ready guy. And I used to, especially Christos's work, I would always sort of just drink his amazing designs in. And um, you emulate things that you see and you love and you try and put your own spin on them and your own techniques. And um, that, that's what I used to do. I mean, that piece you're showing currently is a recent-ish commission that was a reimagining of the Five Doctors um, and uh, got to play around there with a lot of detail and the, the Great Tower of Rassilon and uh, the exploded Dalek, in case you're wondering what that is above that Cyberman. But yeah, all those effects are all painted on meticulously by hand. And um, yeah, it took absolute weeks and weeks to do that one. It's um, not surprising to me that you mention Chris Sakaleos as a, as a major influence. Yeah, obviously, Chris passed away a year ago. We had him as a guest on the show. We were very privileged to interview Chris at length. And he mm -hmm. talked about, about movies, about Ray Harryhausen movies and classic literature and all those kinds of influences on him. And obviously, Chris, he was very closely identified with a very particular line of Doctor Who merchandise, wasn't he? You know, even though he only worked on it for about three or four years, he's seen as the, the gold standard, the big representation. And I think that what he did in his artwork there, I think he was a storyteller in a sense. He would bring in extra elements and, and reframe the, a situation from a television story and, and add extra colour. As you said, Simon, liking it, likening it to a, a movie poster, which is as if it was through a prism of something else. The, uh, same kind of quality you get on a comic book cover. And I feel that it, of all the Doctor Who artists out there, Colin, and this is no slight on, on any of them. You know, I'm a graphic designer myself. There are some people who interpret these stories in a very graphical way, others in a very sort of photo, uh, uh, photorealistic way and all of those ways are viable but you and, and your artwork i see it very much along the lines of okay here it is imagine that story that you saw on television but imagine if you were looking at the same events through this lens instead or from that point of view or or at this particular angle to bring a very particular kind of drama to it and to yeah. tell a slightly different version of the same story mm. Yeah, and to make it look so much more um, effect heavy and uh, fun, I guess, than perhaps it was on screen. 
Um, I mean, I got to indulge my love of aviation and aircraft with uh, that, again, unused VHS cover for, for time flight. And um, that, uh, using the same sort of technique that I did with the five doctors um, to blend out and um, to concentrate on a particular color palette and uh, have that as, uh, as a bit of a, a visual feast. And then it just makes other things pop as well. So, I mean, that citadel was uh, quite a massive amount of detail to, to stick in as well. But you just want to create this fantastic, rich, vibrant, alien looking landscape, which takes you back to, I guess, the imagination side and reading the stories as kids. Um, as you say, as Christos uh, mentioned, with things like uh, those old Ray Harryhausen movies and the Sinbad films and I, you know, they were such a big influence on me as a kid. Yeah. And that's why I love Christos's work so much it. because I would buy every portfolio he did when it came out and um, would just go through them constantly looking at how he put things together and uh, the way he can um, design and expand on ideas. And um, I guess it's something I try to do with uh, Doctor Who. Um, and some of the stories. I mean, some were incredibly difficult to try and come up with an idea for how to make the cover look punchy and vibrant and uh, might catch attention and get some. Well, this is it. It's got to get people att people's attention. Yeah. They've got to stop there in, in the shop or if they're wavering about whether to buy it or not or they think oh i want to get a doctor who video for for my for my sister's kid i know i know he loves doctor who which one shall i get you know it, it's every manner it's commercial art isn't it so it's got to sell people yeah. on this is the one you need to buy this is the mm. story to capture your imagination you know if you like a scary one if you like a spacey one if you like a costume costume drama one you've got to sort of chime in with that and i and you you are absolutely as identified and as identifiable with this line of merchandise, with the VHS range, as Chris was with the Target books, I feel. Yeah, possibly. And it's such a um, forgotten range of artwork now. I mean, you so, think so much is sort of... Makes you, um, what makes you think that? Well, I guess probably because I was um, kind of out in the ether after all the work stopped going into the 2000s. And um, you just felt as though you were consigned to the skip because you suddenly weren't getting work anymore. Um, I had to teach myself to do digital artwork. Um, a friend lent me a computer and uh, showed me the, uh, the rudiments of how to, to do digital art by sticking some glasses on a, a picture of a mallard, uh, a little duck with these uh, clumsy lenses on and um, that's something that I struggled with and tried to work out how to use and um, ended up adopting technique with layers, which was very much like some of the old classic Walt Disney movies, where everything would be on a transparency, and yeah. a background, then middle ground stuff with characters, then foreground things coming up. And uh, yeah, so I, I taught myself in the same way that I mostly taught myself to paint traditionally. So it was just like relearning everything again. But it, a whole new learning curve. Yeah. I, think, I think one of the things that, that, that sort of strikes me most about your your artwork, um, certainly physical artwork, is it's all, without exception, very detailed, very dense and very dramatic. And what I mean by that is, uh, it, 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 the detail is incredible. When you, one of my favourite pieces is the um, is the Sea Devils, um, the one with the Master and and um, the Doctron as well. The, the the detail and the and the attention to detail and the accuracy of the detail is literally breathtaking in it. Um, the dense. When I say dense, I mean there isn't an inch or even a centimetre of, 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 the, of the canvas that isn't utilised to, to, the, to the best degree. You're not, you're not wasteful over any of the space. It's not a case of, oh, well, I'll just leave that space a bit dead and I'll just, I'll just put a bit of a wash of colour over that. No, it, it, you've thought about everything um, and every inch, as I say, has got something happening in it. And dramatic because, 
again, without exception, they're all very, very dramatic pieces. Certainly that time flight, the unused time flight, was just of a minute ago. It's a very, very dramatic piece. Mm. How consciously did you create your style or is it completely and utterly just how it flowed? Is it just, is it just inherent in you? Was it, was it a sort of conscious decision to think on those lines or is that, is that just your, your intrinsic style, do you think? Yes, I think it's just what would come out when faced with a, a blank piece of card or canvas. You, you just try and think, how can I make this look as amazingly dynamic as possible? I mean, especially with airbrushing, it's something else I taught myself to do. Um, you can create such contrast with colors and make them blend together so smoothly and well. And um, that was just something that, that I loved to do and then would try and punch with it as much as possible to make as much impact with, a, with an image, you know. I mean, that one, you kind of can just like dive into it yeah. with the, the depth of detail that I put in. I mean, that barcode there on the Graham Williams merchandise special banner, totally slap bang over that k-led claw hanging out of the casing <laughs> but i i just wanted to get that into it because it was an element of the uh, the program we'd not seen a, a dalek claw like that before and i thought yeah i want to try and get him in there and did uh, you, yeah did you did you have you ever at any point during any of these pieces of, of artwork that you've done which as i say are incredibly detailed were there any points where you kind of thought, oh, I, I really wish I hadn't decided to do all those bricks at the bottom of that particular <laughs> picture, because I've now got to paint each one individually. Have you ever kind of thought, ah, you know, to, are you your own worst enemy in many ways? Extraordinarily so. Um, again, you've got all those spheres, the Dalek balls. Yeah. Um, that was kind of a swear word for me for a while, Dalek balls, um, <laughs> just because of the fact each one had to be so meticulously done to try and make it look round and then get the light hitting it from the correct yeah. perspective. Um, the, the Probably the most ridiculously stupid thing I did was, as you said, with the sea devils, mm -hmm. um, because of those incredible string vests that they yeah. wore. Uh, <laughs> was, oh, I, don't, I don't know why I did that to myself. Because I always work in sort of like, I start with middle ground colors um, or middling colors and then add depth of shadow to that and then go up lighter and lighter and lighter, uh, almost to pure white. And um, you think those sea devil vests for crying out loud, they've all got to be sort of equidistant net spacing. And then each vest has got about seven gradients of color change going through it. So I'm constantly going over and over that and picking more and more bits out. And then of course, yeah, I've got three sea devils on that cover for crying out loud and numpty. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's worst it, enemy to a degree. Yeah, it's, it's that sort of photorealistic style that you are, if you were to go for a graphic style, obviously mm. you can be a lot more bold and a lot more, a lot more general with your washes of color, for example. Whereas because of the style you're going for, it's much more specific. I really do want to talk about this little book because this is where I first came across your work. And, I, and I, I've mentioned this to you previously, that this is one of my favourite pieces of artwork by you. Because if we turn to page 148, we get what I thought was a, just a breathtaking piece of artwork. So this, this book came out in 1984, didn't it? It was written by Peter Haining and it was called Peter The Key Time. to Time. And it had lots, th throughout this book, you've got loads and loads of artwork by various fans. They invited fans to contribute yeah, artwork to, to this book. So you've got loads and loads of different, different drawings in here. And there was one, there was only one that really, really stood out for me and, and literally knocked my socks off. And it was, as I say, this one, uh, which is uh, uh, this beautiful rendering of uh, the Santorin experiment. And I just remember as a child in 1984, when I got this book, I just remember absolutely, you know, obsessing over the detail in this artwork. Firstly, I just love, I, I love the story to begin with. I love the, the Santorin experiment. And so to find this piece of artwork with, with such detail in it, it was just incredible. And I can still remember sitting there at home, looking it's at this piece of artwork and clocking the name 
clocking the name just down, where is it? Right there at the bottom. If you can just about make it out. Have we got it on? Where is it? Uh, oh, right. Down a bit. There it is. I still remember clocking the name Colin Howard and thinking, wow, that guy is an artist of some talent. I was just blown away by it because it's beautiful. Uh, it still blocks, knocks my but it tells off It retells that moment in that story, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and again, it's, it's what I was just talking about. It's so epic, it's so detailed, it's so dramatic. There's so much in it. You could so easily have just gone with the one picture, as, as so many people do, of, of Steyer um, or, or, or whatever. But you didn't. You go, for, you go for so much detail in that one picture. And as you say, Dan, you tell the story. And I just, I, I can remember it to this day, just thinking, wow, he's an artist that stands out. And here you are. You, you, you did it. You did it. Yeah, yeah. I don't think Steyer ever dangled uh, the doctor over a cliff either, did he? You know? Exactly. It's just messing about and creating sort of ideas that you might have in your head. You know, that, that was almost going a bit deadly assassin inside the Matrix battle mm -hmm. um, with, with something that never happened. And but if I you think... look on there as well, I think I actually put the date that I drew it. Whoa, I'm going to try and find that. Hold yeah. on, hold on. <laughs> I've never spotted that. Let me see. Yeah, it's there. I've just found it. It was yeah. painted, get this, on the 27th of December, 1983. I've never even noticed that before. I'm sure you won't manage to make this out, but I'm going to give it a go. Just under 39 years ago. Just right there. There it is, right at the bottom of the doctor's yes. feet. That says, Colin Howard, 27th of December, 1983. What made you, was this the only piece of artwork that you, that you, volunteer to the key to time no there's at least another two in there oh is there yeah there's a an ice warriors one with a sonic cannon there's a sea devil in silurian with um man behaving as brilliantly looking after the planet as we're carrying on in our amazing style there of uh, kicking the, the jesus out of the earth uh yeah like a just indolent disgusting ape Yep, there is the, there's the uh, there's the Silurian one, the sea devil. Yep, and the Silurian's kind of like shrugging his shoulders, going, "What on earth are these monkeys doing to our planet?" Yeah, again, <laughs> so there it's, are it's a beautiful piece of work again. So it's not just a case of the Doctor Who stories that that the artwork's linked to. Each of your pieces of artwork does come with its own story of of its itself doesn't it of how it came to to get on the front of the books or the or the vhs or wherever else we may have seen it on the calendars or, or tucked away in in magazines and, and fanzines and this book this time slides book is an ideal opportunity for you to give us a sort of running commentary too isn't it you've supplemented all of this work with original draft sketches and your stories in your own words haven't you as, you, as you've scrambled back through your through your portfolio about these different choices that you were made or maybe choices that were uh, put upon you <laughs> yeah i mean that carnival of monsters one the image you're showing there is uh, the foxing that i had to remove on all of these because these images were just photocopies that i kept with the original pencil and each one was so badly damaged with foxing that i had to go in digitally and uh, clean it all up removing all this sort of brownish sludgy distortion on it to just leave the, the clear black and white image below. And um, I mean, that one, for example, the, the John Pertwee reference on there is not the Pertwee reference I wanted to use for that picture at all. I selected one of him looking outwards towards the spine of the VHS, which was a still from uh, Day of the Daleks, where Pertwee is looking like a sunlit hero you know, and I wanted <laughs> that symmetry with the design, but I was went, no, you have been looking straight ahead. So I had to just change it. So that one's from, um, I think, uh, yeah, the same story from Day of the Daleks, where he and Joe were on the, the motorcycle, the, the triangle. Yeah. So that's, yeah, it's another did, reference from that. Did you, did you kind of have any run-ins with, with publishers or, or designers where, where you actually argued the toss? Because, again, going back to Chris Akeleos, of course, his most famous one was the argument over keeping Clack on the cover of The Invasion of the Dinosaurs. Did you ever have any, any kind of arguments like that that you really felt so passionately, no, I'm arguing for this, whether you won the arguments or not? <laughs> Or did you just um, give in and roll over and say, yeah, well, I'll do whatever. I don't care. Like, 
can't be bothered. Yeah, I, I think that Carnival of Monsters one was really pretty much the only one I ever had to change. Um, everything else was kind of accepted and gone with. Um, thank God, because when you end up changing an image to um, to incorporate other people's ideas and designs, yeah. it gets really watered down, and uh, you lose that original sort of dynamism and impact. Um, almost uh, a real ponce and go the vision of the creative design and all this. Um, so I was quite lucky with the fact that no, pretty much everything that I did was accepted and didn't have to be changed. Um, the only exception being that little one, oh, sorry, wrong side there, uh, the Power of the Daleks DVD yep. cover. Yeah. Uh, that was quite a, a hard, hard mission to, to come up with the design because it was the first one of the animations that was produced. And at the time they were only going to be in black and white. And that was going to be like a film noir animation with mm. loads of levels of gray shading on all the characters. And um, I was told at the very last minute after being instructed only to use black through to pure white, no color influence at all, that all of a sudden it was going to be also a BBC America color version. Um, and so to add color to the cover. Now, this had taken me a, a few weeks to produce, and it was so heavily detailed. And I even did these kind of like Tim Burton-esque wisps of smoke coming up around the bases of the Daleks, uh, just to add a bit of character into it and a, a bit of individuality. And um, in the end, I ended up having, having to uh, add blue um, with the Dalek rays and uh, the, the spheres on the Daleks, Dalek balls again, there you go. And um, yeah, so it, it ended up being a diluted version of just the pure black and white it was originally always going to be. Um, so that, that was a real Nothing change. like some changing goalposts to keep an artist on, exactly, on their toes. Yeah. You know, I think I also had to do about six different designs for that particular cover as well, because uh, they just weren't happy with um, anything that um, I originally uh, came up with. I think they wanted a particular individual stamp. And um, it ended up being the only one I was asked to do, um, but still set the template for all the others that followed, which is quite strange. Um, but they went with solely a, a closer to camera, larger doctor from the flat, kind of 2D animation look. Uh, with some other sort of stuff around. I think the steel books got a bit more creative um, and they were rather nice. But um, at that stage, I'd again changed hats and um, become sort of part of the animation team. Yeah, I hadn't realised that you were as deeply involved in these animations as you are. So can you explain what your role has been on those productions? And... Uh, well, it... it yeah, as you say, it started with just being asked to do the cover. I'd done an interview with Charles Norton uh, a few years previously for Doctor Who magazine. And um, he, I think, liked my work back with the VHSs and asked if I'd come back and sort of revisit and do a cover for the first of these um, new animations. Um, it then got to, I think, the weekend before the whole thing was going to go off to be um, stamped and released. Uh, well, printed, uh, whatever, cast to digital media. And um, they realized they had no TARDIS um, exterior for the arrival or the leaving in episodes one and six. And he said, oh, God, could you perhaps do a TARDIS? And I went, yeah, sure. So I sat there on a Saturday morning and started painting in Photoshop this sort of like gray layered TARDIS, which ended up then being included in the animation. And because I was able to sort of create that quickly and to a, a massive level of detail, um, he then asked if I might consider returning um, with working on Sharda. And um, that was all digital work for me. Um, all the, uh, the Cambridge Lane cycling stuff, all the shops, I put tons and tons of in-jokes uh, in there, which I think the Dwas put out uh, on one of their publications as well to show all the detail of stuff. I did like Bellal's Bakery 
and loads of really bad um, Romana's flower shop and things like this. And um, I think the, the toy shop that I did um, had tons and tons of Doctor Who uh, things in the window from the Yeti through to uh, the Clockwork Soldiers and all this Brilliant. kind of stuff. It appeals to that playful sense of humour that you've got, doesn't it, to do things like that? Well, you know, it, it's uh, making a rod for your own back in some ways. Um, because with Sharda as well, we have this scene where uh, the fourth Doctor comes through this sort of corridor uh, between TARDISes to drop in back in his, um, his old place. And he drops down into the, um, the TARDIS um, workshop. And... Um, they thought it'd be a nice idea to have these shelving units with a few bits and pieces of stuff for him to go through and peruse. And um, I ended up putting tons and tons of uh, homage Easter eggs back to previous stories and even a couple from future stories that hadn't happened. Oh, some people really don't like that, Colin. I know, yeah. but I've been... It's curious. a tougher sell, mate. It's a tougher sell. It's about, you know... Um, yeah, I put like a communicator from the two doctors, Sontar and uh, worn on the belt on one of the shelves, and also Lynx's, uh, just to sort of like mess about. Uh -huh. And uh, Croton arms and weapons and the Cyberman head and stuff like that. So, so obviously, uh, obviously, working on those projects, that's very much part of a team of people, though, isn't it? So, how do you find that compared to working, working on your own? Because that's, you know, generally speaking, that's what artists do isn't it we work in, very, in a very sort of solitary way yeah we just sit in cupboards um <laughs> yeah. uh, which which weirdly yes yeah, so, uh, it carried on that way because um obviously pandemic later but um well with working on these i was still sat in my room uh my sort of house studio it's just a little room upstairs going slowly crazy going slowly crazy this is michelle <laughs> by the way she was wandering around she Hello, Michelle. Hello. Hello. Say hi. Hello, hi. Michelle. Hello. How are you? It's How lovely. You it's, it, it's it's lovely to see you. And uh, we, we 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 have to talk about you at some point anyway, because I know you're just such a big. Yeah, we do, because I know you're just such a big part of Colin's life. Um, and so you know, it, it's it's good that you managed to to pop your face in oh. and say hello. Hello, hello. I'm going back to work. I'll leave you to it. <laughs> Uh, some of us have got to work, some of us have got to keep the money rolling in. <laughs> I know, others just like to talk about themselves all day. So I, I was I was thinking though, but working with the slotting into a team of people like that and, and having your your end of the deal to hold up and that and the deadlines obviously to, to meet, they never change. How different was, was all of that to working with, with Sean at Candy Jar? on time slides because obviously they've been putting together putting out publishing this line of um specialist interest doctor who titles haven't they lavish celebrations and collections of other artists work too along with a legacy of of other titles there they've got a really nice niche collection of books going and it seems to be a well-oiled machine so how did how did colin howard drop into all that so I, I was casting around trying to think, what can I do to get back and do some Doctor Who stuff? And um, coincidentally, um, via Facebook, Andy Franken-Mallon, who was a, a writer and I think a producer working very closely with Sean on Candy Jar, um, asked me if I'd consider coming and doing The Beast of Fang Rock. Um, that was like a heart back to sort of a dearly loved period of Doctor Who of mine. And so it was like, oh, yeah, love to, you know. Um, and so that ended up being something that I did that was in a very painterly kind of style, but a fully digital piece. So there is no, like, original hard copy of that knocking about. Um, it is just a, a digital piece of artwork. Um, but I like to sort of work in a style that looks very much like my regular work and uh, it's something that I've sort of tinkered about with for many years. Because I, I said about um, those dark days at post uh, the VHS covers and learning to do things on computer. I ended up going off and just working as a, um, a jobbing illustrator for uh, two or three art agencies over the years, um, doing anything that came my way, really. 
you know, and I was just pining to get back and do some sort of Doctor Who related stuff. Because so, you are a very accomplished all round illustrator, it has to be said. It's it's not all string vests and bumps. I mean, your your animal artwork, I think, is absolutely absolutely beautiful, really uh -huh. full of character. Yeah, I, I, I'm a, a severe lover of nature and uh, birds and animals. I mean, um, there's a, a section in the book where we talk about um, for my wife's birthday, for Michelle's birthday, we went off and worked on a cheetah conservation project in South Africa. Um, so that was getting up incredibly early in the morning with uh, going out on really long walks, like seven kilometers or so, with uh, cheetahs that were hand reared and it was trying to get them back to being able to hunt. And uh, we'd be going out with these um, big putty cats because they'd come up to you purring. I mean, to have a, a big cat come up to you, purring around and wanting its tummy rubbed, it was just <laughs> ridiculous. It was like, you know, I've dropped into some kind of bizarre film here, you know. But um, we then have to chase through the brush and try and keep an eye on where they've gone and brought the kill down. And uh, then we have to try and wrestle the kill away from them and uh, carry it back about another sort of three kilometers or so back to base. Because if they sat there with the kill, they'd just gorge and get stuffed and then wouldn't want to move for about three or four hours. So that, that was a bit, bit tricky. Getting, uh, getting like a, a junior ostrich away from a very annoyed cheetah that this is my toy, leave it with me. So, uh, <laughs> so that was great. <laughs> yeah, what and, a very strange way to spend your respite. And, and of course, it's not it, it's not just Doctor Who as a genre piece that you've only done loads of other genre stuff as well. Alien, Blake Seven, Babylon Five, uh, Quantum Leap, some brilliant stuff for Hellraiser, Star Wars. You know, you, you've, you've done them all, haven't you? Let's be honest, you have done them all. Well, I've, I've painted all of them. I mean, some of those were just um, pieces that I did for myself. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, with the, the mention of Star Wars, I had to um, do a couple of pieces um, to be approved and they're sort of in storage somewhere at uh, Skywalker Ranch because they like to uh, keep hold of, um, you know, what these people have done for them. And yeah. I did a collector's plate for The Phantom Menace um that was a, a critique. i remember that yeah a critique that came back that was um darth maul's left pupil or so could it be moved slightly about three quarters <laughs> of, you know or, or a millimeter or so to the left uh, <laughs> so to then have to meticulously work on this tiny little pupil and just shape it's like uh, there have been some odd requests but uh, yeah that was that was probably one of the proudest was to be approved uh, by Lucasfilm um, was, was if quiet. there's one franchise that I associate you with almost as much as Doctor Who it's probably Red Dwarf Colin you seem to do a lot of Red Dwarf artwork back in the 90s there's nothing more 90s than Red Dwarf come to think of it is there <laughs> no probably not um, that was the lovely John Freeman, my first editor at Doctor Who magazine. Uh, when things were starting to get a bit ropey for traditional artwork, he mentioned about uh, Fleetway Publications had started to do a, or were planning to do a Red Dwarf magazine. And um, I ended up producing about seven covers for them from issue two onwards. Uh, it ran for about two and a half, three years. Yeah, I and, bought them all. Uh, yeah, there was a little bit of tinkering around. I mean, <laughs> that one for issue three, I think, with them all looking at this blank bit of table. It, there was a be Beware Cadmium 3 radiation leak badge on that desk where they were all looking. So I had to move all their pupils to be looking down at this particular area, which is why some of the expressions don't look quite right, because it's not as you can remember the reference. So, uh, so yeah, that was a bizarre fun one. And um, I started to do the odd Red Dwarf fan club event. And it was while there that Danny John Jules, who plays the cat, came through and uh, saw me in the merchandise area and was looking through my portfolio. And um, he was planning this single for Tongue Tide, which was a novelty song from about season two or three of Red Dwarf. Sorry for yeah. not knowing the precise episode, etc. Yeah, you're right. It's um, series two. Yeah. 
and um so it was like could you could you do a like a cover for me for that and i was like yeah delighted to so that ended up being for emi records and uh, that was about the third design of them i did a few variations where um kit uh cat's love interest was like sat on the back of a kneeling Dwayne Dibley and stuff like that. So um, yeah, that, that was all totally created from scratch, just the odd photo reference for the uh, the Dwayne Dibley face and um, then to distort the cat one and have that tongue coming out with the, the heart floating away off. Uh, it's just sort of mess about, silly stuff. But yeah, I really enjoyed Red Dwarf as a, as a youngster when it started. And um, yeah. yeah, I've stayed up to date with them um, the more recent one on on day the last one was absolutely brilliant and yeah, promised uh, land yep that was that was really good and i i go to the uh, the fan club conventions dimension jumps uh when they ask me along and uh, yeah it's lovely to produce a new piece of art for them although now i think it's all going to have to be just digital uh because my painting now unfortunately with my ms is kind of getting a little bit too much to be able to do anymore. Um, a painting that would have taken me, say, like Inferno in three days, and um, then it became more like two weeks. And yeah. um, the last one I did, I think, took me four and a half months oh. to actually finish. So it, it's no longer financially viable, you know. I'd have to charge the absolute, if not the Earth, Venus as well, you know, for a piece. And it's just. And is, and, and is this purely because of the MS that, that, that causes you problems? What with your hands or, or with your, is it your eyesight that, 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 that is problematic? Uh, you might notice and watch back, my hands shake a bit now, which they never really used to. But it started in my feet and got both my legs uh, to the extent where my balance is atrocious. So people just think I've been all nighter at the pub at like uh, seven in the morning because my walking is so atrocious and I fall over quite a lot now. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's now spread to my hands and typically being right-handed, my right hand and forearm are worst affected. Right. And, um, I've been dropping airbrushes and they land needle down and it bends them and splits the nozzles. So it makes them sort of irreparable. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just the ability to sort of hold something to the level of dexterity required for the kind of paintings that I love to do. Um, it's just too much now. Uh, so that's me messing about with my Wacom tablet that I bought uh, to work on Evil of the Daleks. It's a, a new large one that um, makes things a bit easier for me. Um, but the Wacom pens are so much easier for me to hold because they're rubberized and uh, yeah. I can sort of hold them fairly well. And the fact that it's digital means that if I shake a bit, I can then change and uh, erase the mistake that I just created and uh, go again. So, Your okay. attitude and adaptability, it's inspiring. You, you seem to be a, a man who's no stranger to learning curves throughout your life. Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of go along with that. Um, but it's one of those things, isn't it? You, you're faced with something delightful like that. You can either sit in a corner and wallow in self-pity and make everybody think, oh, God, I don't want to spend any time with that miserable soul. You know, just make everyone around you unhappy as well. So what, what's the point in that? You know, that's no life. That's no fun. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just do what you can and to the best ability that you can. You're, 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 you're clearly a glass half full kind of person as opposed to a glass half empty kind of person. Certainly the impression I get from sort of watching you on, on social media is that you, you haven't, although the multiple sclerosis must have affected your life, you haven't let it affect it more than it would anyway. You, as you say, you, haven't, you don't appear on the surface to have become a slave to it or let it sort of dominate your life in any way. Well, no, yeah. Um, it, it's either that or I'm able to escape it into a big enough fantasy world myself to sort of deny what's happening to me. I don't know, uh, possibly. But um, no, I, I just, you know, do what I can. I mean, my, my dad had a similar thing. I mean, I mentioned it in Time Slides. Um, he was a, um, a, 
a builder, painter and decorator in the end. And um, during the sort of early 70s, I think it was, he, um, as he was getting a bigger family, thought, look, I need a more reliable income. So he went off and worked at Richard Clay Bookbinders uh, and Printers in Bungie in Suffolk, and they did all the Harry Potter ones recently. Okay. And um, so he, he was working there, and uh, he was at the Bookbinding Press, and I think it was his, I can't remember which hand, sorry, Dad, I think it's his uh, right one, uh, got caught in the Bookbinding Press, and uh, they had to take him to a hospital, and he had a, a plastic bag of remnants of himself in of his hand You're joking and they rebuilt his hand with uh, a couple of knuckles at least on the inside so his hand sort of sits like this most uh -huh. of the time and uh, he was an amazing um snooker player uh, when he was in the army and he always loved playing snooker and so he again just thought i need to sort of get back some ability and uh, he retained and regained his ability to play snooker to a very high level. Um, so it's it's that kind of thing. You have these examples, and you just think, I'd rather be like that, you know, rather than a miserable top. <laughs> well, uh, exactly. and, what's, and what's and what's also interesting is I know I, I remember a few years ago um, Michelle did a, a crowd funding. Uh, thing for you for for a, 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 a as i recall it was motorized wheelchair to be able to get you out into into nature as you've already talked about yeah. um and as i recall um you know the the, the donations went exceeded way exceeded expectations that must have been quite i don't know how did you feel about that you must have felt really quite elated on the one hand that people really just wanted to contribute to this i know it's it it's like um I mentioned with the uh, testimonials in time slides, you sort of don't kind of accept or take on just how other people might feel about you, uh, about things you've done in the past with, with your art or whatever. And um, you, I'm, I really wasn't expecting the wheelchair fund to do that much. I thought we might be lucky and get a couple of thousand towards this chair. And it's a ridiculously expensive thing. I mean, it sat right next to me, but I can't really move the um, the monitor around to show you guys without wrecking the, the layout and the shots and everything. And you know how fussy I am about layout. Um, <laughs> yeah, this this chair was like just over eleven thousand pounds in the end. And um, Michelle set the target at ten, and we thought that would be great if you know by any strange stretch of fantasy that we might get anywhere near that amount and um, i think within about two months yeah. we uh, had the ten thousand pounds that we'd um, asked for um and it was just so humbling it's incredible um yeah it, it kind of reduces you to tears um to to be affected in that way. well so. if, if, if nothing else it gives you kind of a, a quantifiable idea of of how much your 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 work is loved and and, and how much you, it's meant to people and and again i remember when we spoke to um to chris Achilles, he was the same he, he was very humble about it and he almost he didn't realize how much his stuff is loved and i guess that to an extent is because you're sitting there in your little cupboard doing your artwork popping it out there you don't know how much this means to people and it clearly oh, means I'm, I'm behind them there guys you just had a shot I'm, oh. I'm behind them yeah um, on the wall That's oh there the, you go oh it's your it's your, it's your attack, attack of the side man there yeah. it is your attack of the side man cover brilliant yeah i i was having a bit of a a bad time with mobility with my ms uh when that target exhibition was um, uh -huh. went on uh, down in London, so I couldn't make it down there. I was invited along because, as you see, my yeah. my one cover was there, and um, yeah, I so regret not going. Um, but you know, that's just what happens, isn't it? You know, so I, it's a beautiful cover, if nothing else. The Attack of the Sun cover is a magnificent piece of artwork. Absolutely fabulous. Yeah, one of again, one of my favourites. And a time I think a new. 
yourself and Pete Warbank, new artists were coming through right at the tail end, weren't, that, weren't you, of the book range? And it was yeah. sort of her heralding the, the dawn of a, of a new decade, really. And I suppose all the various other things that were, the, that were to come when the book range wrapped up. Art for the ears now, everybody, just for a couple of minutes. It's time to check in with our Kev. He's standing by with a, <laughs> a portfolio full of podcasts covering all your favourite franchises, all part of the Fandom Podcast Network. You're going to love this trip sideways in time and in space. Colin, Simon and I will be back in a couple of minutes before you know it. <laughs> Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. Here are the other great shows on the Fandom Podcast Network. Culture Clash, where we discuss the latest in entertainment and pop culture. Blood of Kings, our show covering the entire Highlander universe. Couch Potato Theater, we celebrate our favorite movies. And Time Warp, our fandom flashback show discussing a year in movies and our favorite retro movie, TV, and pop culture topics. Good evening, discussing all things Alfred Hitchcock. Hair Metal Podcast. We cover the rock metal music of the 80s and early 90s. Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast discussing the time-traveling Doctor Who universe. Letha Mullet, an action film podcast covering the 80s, 90s, and beyond. Also, check out the Letha Mullet Network for more great podcasts. What a Piece of Junk, our Star Wars podcast. Making Treks, a Star Trek podcast with a deep dive into the final frontier. The Fandom Show. Our Fandom Podcast Network live YouTube show discussing the hottest topics in fandom. The True Believers MCU Podcast discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Television Universe. Union Federation, our Star Trek and the Orville show. And we're proud to welcome the BQN Network to the Fandom Podcast Network. Please visit our friends on the BQN Network, a Star Trek Universe podcast that also includes your favorite topics, movies, history, superheroes, and more. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on YouTube. The Fandom Podcast Network is also on all major podcast platforms. The Fandom Podcast Network audio master feed is on Podbean at fpnet.podbean.com. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom. Hello. Yes, we've teased and tantalized you there, and we can even clothe you too. There's merch to match all of those shows, including Type 40. If you head over to tpublic.com, search for the Fandom Podcast Network, and that's where you'll find a store full of all the team colors for all of the podcasts on everything from the t-shirts and phone covers and all that kind of stuff right the way up to those big tapestries that you can plaster your feature wall with. Seeing is believing. Treat yourself, treat your other selves. And it all goes to support the Fandom Podcast Network into the bargain. So everybody wins. We're still here with the much loved Doctor Who artist Colin Howard and Simon Horton, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and Simon Horton, of course, marking the publication of this enormous collection, this wealth of artwork from your time illustrating Doctor Who, on, mostly on VHS, the VHS covers you've said it focuses on all that material. Could there possibly be a Time Slides Volume 2 awaiting somewhere in the future? Can you, any, any word yet? Any word? Well, I'm incredibly hopeful that it will, um, because there are quite a few things that I've done um, and published in the past on, on things, yeah. lots of uh, Doctor Who covers uh, for the magazine, um, quite a few of the uh, the Virgin books, bits and pieces, like some of these decalogues. I'll oh, never yeah. get used to this mirroring screen. Guys. So, so much. Um, yeah, so there's quite a few things like that. There's tons of private commissions and pieces that I've done, um, even to the extent sometimes of um, stories that I really wanted to do and never got the chance. Uh, to, to do one of those because they'd already been released on VHS when I was doing them. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, being, being a fan, I, I was always thinking of things that um, I might love to see, you know. Um, I mean, back in this thing here, I mean, I spent Christ knows how long doing this, which is a, um, a rock. Oh, that's, wow. that's incredible. 
So it's we're going to get a, a black and white illustration that covers much of the stories that were written by the late, great Robert Holmes, arguably the best of all the Doctor Who yeah. writers. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's the Shrubenzal down the bottom. There aren't many people who've done a piece of artwork of the Shrubenzal. So, so <laughs> hats off to you on that one, Colin. And the, can we, the, 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 the rendition of, of, of the master, the, the decaying master there, is just absolutely, that, that alone is just, look at that. I mean, the, the detail Gorgeous. of that, that yeah. is just utterly magnificent. Some what, artists are intimidated by, by jobs like that, but I I feel that you aren't, or is it kind of like you said to Simon earlier on, you, you steam in and then worry about it later? <laughs> yeah, that's essentially it, yeah. I mean, you think <laughs> that that was pretty much all done with a rotary repeatograph pen, which were like drafts. I remember them. Uh, and, and, and when was when was that, Colin? When, when are we dating, for example, that piece of art? These black and whites, when are these from? Oh, Christ, they're from like the very early 80s. Wow. Um, so this I is basically fantastic. at the sort of at the kind of time that you're 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 putting stuff forward for for the key to time or yeah yeah so i, w I was always thinking of things um i mean some of these ended up in doctor who a celebration uh that was printed i think a year or two after um the key to time one and um yeah the i did one for each doctor and then i started doing full-size companion ones as well and um yeah i was messing about with those i mean i show you guys before we started the um the turlo and the tractator that, well, that one in yeah. particular is just be, the, the the likeness of mark strickson there is it is uncanny i mean that literally could be a photograph it's beautiful and then you've got the lovely nicola as well yeah yeah so, the, 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 so yeah, I, I kind of doing one for each companion and stuff like that. So yeah. Oh wow, that's fantastic! Black, I mean, black. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. I can beautiful. I just put the Cyberman at the back there. It's, it's it's fantastic. I mean, black and white art. Do you have a love for black and white art? That's different to your for, for, to a love for doing color. You know, are you? Is it a case that yeah, you love doing both, but you'd always rather do color? Um, it was a case of. I used to just sit hunched over on my single bunk bed in my bedroom uh, with a sort of A4 pad on my lap or an A3 pad and just be dotting away doing stuff like this. It was how I spent most of my days. Uh, it's probably why my posture is so atrocious nowadays. Also, it was the expense at the time as well because it was so much cheaper just to buy ink for your pen mm -hmm. and keep reloading that than it would have been endless tubes of paint and stuff. So I, I concentrated mostly on illustration and black and white work uh, to begin with, and that's, um, that's where I sort of set my hat there and with working with Doctor Who magazine, doing their archive illustrations and things for John, um, which then led on to a few book things and stuff later on. I was, uh, games Workshop doing their um, Warhammer yeah. stuff as well. Yeah. Oh, that was you too, was it? Yeah. I mean, again, again, I had all that stuff. I had no idea that was you again. Yeah. Do you yeah. have a favourite piece, Colin? A very favourite piece, or is that an impossible choice? Oh God, um, I've got this real massive soft spot for my Sea Devils VHS. Yeah. Um, it's mostly, I think, because of my love of that story. Yeah, and it was a summertime repeat. Yes, um, way, way, way back, and uh, we just sat and watched this full motion picture length version of the Sea Devils, and uh, I just so loved them. And I read and reread Malcolm Hook's book, yeah. and um, just had a real thing for the Eocenes and the Silurians. So, uh, and that one I've refused to sell a few times, and it's under my sofa currently in a big what place. i hope it's safe under your sofa right? oh yeah 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 uh, encapsulated <laughs> in plastic and uh, in, a, in a massive portfolio what would you describe as your biggest artistic challenge so far oh good god um probably something like the five doctors because mm -hmm. of the fact that there was so much to try and encapsulate in the one image and uh, so much to Thanks, Terence. <laughs> yeah. And to have all those creatures in there. I mean, I got to, to, to put a Yeti on the cover. I mean, come on. Um, that, that was big for me. And, uh, and more Cybermen. 
because there was kind of an agreement at the time with the VHSs uh, that um, only Andrew would do the Cyberman ones. And um, it was just a case of you agreed to, to whatever they kind of said you were going to do. So I was able to sneak that Cyberman one under the radar. I don't think they realized they were in it. Who, Did who knows? Was was there was there any was there any of the covers, for example, that you just really struggled to get right? That was just you you tearing your hair out. You couldn't get it right. You couldn't get a likeness right, for example. Was there one that you really really struggled over? Um, I think the one that was the biggest struggle to actually come up with the composition for was the major problem was Paradise Towers. Mm -hmm simply because it was uh, very studio bound and yeah. so uh, mundane with like people's flats and things in this tower block. <laughs> and there's only, only these couple of these establishing painting shots, I think, map paintings or something, of the exterior of the towers. Yeah. And that's all you had to play with. There were so few reference photos from that but, story as well where that must have made it even harder but it's actually remarkably dramatic the artwork for paradise towers is remarkably dramatic it paints a completely different story to the one that made it to the television uh, that's the one with the, with the doctor and mel and the yeah. swimming pool isn't it the yellow yeah, pool cleaning right, robot yeah. sort of coming out of the water yeah yeah and it looks is... which looks terrible on screen but you managed to make it look actually you sell decent. it so well <laughs> oh bless uh, so Jamie Ledman said, damn you for making me watch Time Flight. <laughs> uh, he recently got a copy of the book and I think he was like, oh, this one. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that, that one was great. And thank you, Radio Times, because they did a feature um, back then. And being a Doctor Who fan, I collected anything that had Doctor Who printed in it that I could afford or knew about. And uh, there was this specially staged shot and it was that reference. Mm -hmm. of Sylvester and, and Bonnie uh, wrestling with pool cleaner robot and so I had the big looming cleaner coming in behind which never happened and uh, created some of the uh, the grotty graffiti laden sort of dreary setting um, and had to run with that because otherwise you're working for a science fiction show so you're hoping there's going to be a big spacey battle and you know, loads of explosions and things, but that was rarely in Doctor Who. Yeah, absolutely. And when it was, it was a lovely matter of in props hanging on string and stuff. <laughs> well, you say that, but, you know, times times do change, and, and uh, times change again, don't they? Does Doctor Who still stimulate you and excite you? And, and if if not, what does? Do you still play pay close attention to what's going on on the series and do you go to the cinema do you still like modern movies and and follow the genre generally yeah i still love doctor who um i mean there's a, a capaldi piece above there for face the yeah. raven which is in the book i mean um there was a guy commissioning um, me on a semi-regular basis back then and uh, i said oh, i loved face the raven any chance i could uh, do that for you and um he was like, oh, I've just commissioned someone else. I was like, oh, okay. So I painted it myself just for the love of, uh, of the show and uh, that particular story. And, uh, well, okay, a bit of the love of Jenna Coleman, but that's another thing in time. <laughs> uh, yes, it's this guy yes, uh... that was, uh, was commissioning them at the time. So, uh, so, yeah, I still really follow Doctor Who and love it. Um, there are other shows as well that are great. And uh, I really enjoy, I mean, things like Good Omens are fantastic. Um, yeah. I really enjoyed Game of Thrones, uh, even quite like the last episode. Don't you go, how about that? Well, you're the only one in the world that did, I think. <laughs> Probably I'm afraid to say it. In my escape world of fantasy, you see, I obviously registered it as being brilliant television. But um, now I, I follow all sci-fi stuff and uh, I would love to go and do the film thing a lot more often, but I... Uh, I'm fairly sort of housebound now, uh, hence you mentioned about the chair earlier. So I can't really walk very far anymore. And um, sitting in a, in a theatre for a length of time without assistance uh, for facilities or the sort of yeah. thing that you'd need to do while sitting yeah. in the theatre for a long time. 
Uh, yeah, so it, it makes uh, going out very difficult. Well, so I'm not sure you're missing. Fantastic. I'm not sure you're missing an enormous amount these days. I have to be honest. These days, I don't go to the theatre, the cinema very often. But it's because there's not much that's any good on. I find these days, the, the, I really do think that you, the, the, well, the, the golden era of of genre stuff for me personally has has, has peaked. Uh, and it is now in decline. <laughs> For me, it's all spot by people who refuse to come off their spot their smartphones, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> Lights off screens everywhere. Oh, oh no, no, no. It's like going to the zoo, mate. It's going to the one, zoo. One of the, the last films I saw at the cinema, like actually the last one I saw at the cinema, was uh, Taika Waititi's uh, Jojo Rabbit. Oh, and it's brilliant. That was absolutely fantastic. You're obviously. right. You're, you're laughing, you're sobbing. It's an incredible um, film. It and, is. Um, then the pandemic, hmm. just when I was so hopeful of going to see Tenet. Oh, the Christopher Nolan film. Yeah. Yeah. Never mind, eh? There we go. You win <laughs> some, you lose some. Yeah. So, well... so, so no, it's not so bad now. Yeah, I'll, I'll just watch things in 4K at home. Thank you. Very I much. think I think it's, I think it's about the best. Home way cinema, it. home cinema is is where it's at. But no, I, I think again, this is a delightful story to hear. How it does seem that you're okay. I, I think there is. If somebody's artistic, it's going to come out eventually anyway. But something like Doctor Who does have this habit, doesn't it, of of uh, connecting and bringing it into reality that bit quicker, Colin. You must meet a lot of aspiring artists or talk to other artists, either your peers, for for example, or people who come to you for advice. Is it a sort of remix of the same story that you hear over and over again? Because just some of the things that you've spoken about, like, for example, my dad was also a painter and decorator. I also have an A4 full of illustrations that I did for fanzines in black and white, some of them published by that guy from, the, from around the time. It, they're common things that link us all, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um... I can confidently state there's a whole generation full of Doctor Who fans who cherish cherish the memories of collecting the VHS range all yeah. through the 90s just as much as earlier earlier generations did the target books seeing your artwork more often than not and yeah the, this book time slides the doctor who artwork of colin howard with its newly revised cover too it's available now as a limited edition hardback and a paperback and it features colin's paintings as they were originally intended to be seen so they're uncropped uncluttered by logos and captions and whatever else and presented alongside his own commentary and design sketches as he would have sent them in to the bbc for for the various refinements between getting the the idea from his page onto our shelves all through the 1990s so they can order that right now from candy jar books can't they colin absolutely it's um it's an incredibly lavish looking book to be honest I'm so happy with how it's come out. Um, my overriding concern would be the uh, the print quality for the plates of the artwork. Never mind the uh, the rampant garbage that spews from my mouth and ends up <laughs> on the pages. But um, yeah, the the print job is absolutely beautiful. And I'm incredibly happy with how it looks. So uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's amazing after all these years. You know, to see these things again, to be out there, and uh, for to enable people to say the collection is pretty big for the VHSs, and it's the first and only time possibly they'll all be in the same place at once. It's, so uh, it yeah. is. It's a. It, it is a beautiful book. It's. A, it looks a beautiful piece of work. You must be very proud of that book. Yeah, yeah. I. It's something I. I sort of like dreamed might happen as a child. You yeah. Know, and, and then there's that kind of like weird reality of oh it has happened now um how strange <laughs> well it's, it's a testament to your talent that it, it's happened so you know you take all credit for that well, as you. always all the links about where to get your copy of time slides they'll be in the show notes to the podcast and the description to the video track too we'll make sure that you're directed right there to get your copy of time slides from candy jar books the doctor who artwork of colin howard and that's the old girl starting up and calling time on yet another edition of type 40 a doctor who podcast 
I'll be back with another one soon. Look out for that wherever you found this. It could have been at the dedicated home feed for Type 40 at type40.podbean.com. You can go there and get audio editions of all of our live stream show too. So that's Type 40 Live and Type 40 Doctor Who podcast all at type40.podbean.com or on the podcatcher of your choice. Apple Podcasts, for example, over on Spotify. We're on Amazon Music now too. Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Podbay, all those places. We're on YouTube. Of course we are, the world's largest streaming platform here on the Spacebook channel and over on the fandom... Fo- over on the Fandom Podcast Network's own master feed. That's loaded up with uh, so many treats for your ears. Never mind on the weekly, it's coming at you on the daily there. So if you take a trip sideways in time, you can get a whole load more of quality podcasts from the Fandom Podcast Network. And it could be you want to have your say about all of this, about Colin's fabulous career and his huge portfolio of Doctor Who work. You can do so. You can get in touch with us through the comment section here or through our social media. You can find that on Instagram and Twitter at Type40DoctorWho, Who, or you can email us, Type40DoctorWho at gmail.com. And if you're feeling really brave, you can join us in the Type40 Facebook group. Simply go over to Facebook, and uh, yeah, that's, th- that's still the most widely used social media platform, I'm pretty sure it is. So go over to Facebook and type in Type40, and we will appear in the in the searches for the social media groups. So there's Type 40, a Doctor Who fan group, and there's our Type 40 Doctor Who Blu-ray and DVD collectors group too that goes deep dive on all the physical media. We do have VHS items in there too, Colin. So there's lots of your work turns up in the feed there. The general physical media, there's no holds barred there in our Facebook groups. What else, what else? Yeah, we can we can also say that over on the social medias right now, there's things shared every single day from within our own community. So generations upon generations worth of Doctor Who memories, get in touch and send them in, and we'll always credit every. It's a bit like it's a bit like Vision On, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to worry about returning them, but we do credit any fan art that we publish because we do believe very much, as a lot of us are artists ourselves, in one way, shape, or no, that was, no, nobody said piss artist. <laughs> in one way, shape, or form. So any art that we do share through our social medias, we always credit it, and we're happy to uh, you have to give a showcase to any upcoming artists, traditional or digital. We love it. All. Colin, do you work? Uh, do you Instagram? Do you Twitter? Do you do any, do any of that stuff? Where can people find you yeah, on social I, media? And what's I your do. website I, called? Yeah, across um, all those three platforms uh, that you mentioned, uh, Twitter is at Colin Howard Art. Um, I'm um, uh, Colin Howard Artwork, I think, on Facebook and on Instagram as well. So uh, easy enough to, to find my stuff. Um, and that guy just above my head, that little silver buddy up there, is the um, the cover star of that release. Ah! Oh wow! Because the um, he I photographed from three different angles uh, on my windowsill up in my tiny little workroom, and no. he's actually the reference for those three Daleks on the uh, the cover. Oh, brilliant! I thought I'd give him a little bit of uh, time and some credit there because otherwise, you, story, you, you don't want to annoy Daleks too much. They get a bit grumpy. And then, Never you do have your own. Daleks. You do have your own website as well, don't you, Colin? Which is a, a, a online portfolio of not just your Doctor Who work, but all the other things you've done too, isn't it? Yeah, ColinHowardArtwork.com. Um, if it's still up and running, I think the server. It is. Been, been a bit tricky of late. And um, yeah, at hopefully at some point I will get to actually update it because it hasn't been updated for, oh God, about 15 years. <laughs> and Simon, where can people find you on social media? What are you up to? Oh, they can, they can find me on uh, Facebook. That's where they can find me under the Hoonatics. Come and say hello there. <laughs> and you can catch me on Instagram and Twitter as the Spacebook, where I am wheezing and groaning, ranting and raving about all things geeky inside and outside of the TARDIS. Whatever catches my eye, my imagination, or both. I'm there tweeting and gramming and whatever else about it when I have the spare moment. It can sort of take over your life, can't it, social media? But yeah, 
<laughs> but yeah, that's yeah. it for this time. Get in touch with with whatever, whatever you want to know, whatever comments you've got about this show, and what's going on on Type Forty and Type Forty Live, and we'll we'll put you in touch with Colin. Maybe if you've got any further questions about yeah, could could a second volume of Time Slides be on the way? But more importantly, yeah, what, what do you think? I'm sure Colin would love to know about yeah when you unwrap your copy and and feast on all those beautiful sites on the pages and all the memories that that stirs up from the past. But that's it for this time. Thanks for watching and thanks for listening. We always have the time if you have the space here at Type 40. Thank you for being our guest this time, Colin. Thank it's you, been Colin. A, it's been a delight. We'd love to have you back at some point in the future. Yeah, of course, that, that would be amazing. And have a fantastic Christmas 2022, 23, everybody. There you go. Can't say much fantastic. for that, can we? <laughs> oh. There we are. <laughs> yes, thank you, everybody. We'll catch you again soon. You take care. Bye-bye.